This Advent, we're looking at one of the most unique baby reveals of all time. And as we talked last week, baby reveals can be very exciting, but in other ways, baby reveals can be very disappointing, such as the cases here. That last one, where he's got three daughters standing around him, and it comes out pink, and he just falls to the ground. Oh, golly. We have uh, expectations, and when those expectations are not met, then we are very disappointed. And uh, we're living in a time where people are very disappointed in Jesus. They're very disappointed in, in uh, the Christian faith, and they're walking away from Jesus. He's losing ground in our culture. We've gone from a nation in the late 1990s to from about uh, 85% who, who would name themselves to be Christians to now uh, less than 70%. He is losing ground. In fact, I read an article in, in Europe. There is a growing number of people who are wanting to be unbaptized. They're going through the process of being unbaptized. And the church is wrestling with how in the world you unbaptize a person. But uh, the disappointing, the disappointment factor seems to kind of be growing. And uh, here's the question. Is our disappointment with Jesus growing? If we were honest with ourselves on a scale of 1 to 10, what would our disappointment with Jesus be these days? Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, I pray that you would uh, open our eyes to who you are, because it's easy to, uh, to forget and then be disappointed. Father, if there would be anything that would hinder us hearing you and your word and your Holy Spirit speaking to our hearts, I pray that you would remove it, because we've come to be changed, to sit at the feet of Jesus to hear the words of Jesus, and to be changed to be more like Jesus. We pray these things in, our, in your son's name. Amen. So, so much anticipation of this one who was coming. There was a thrill of hope. You see, in the original reveal, it was a time of darkness for the people of God. 
they were losing uh, on all fronts in the game of life. They were facing difficulties. And this word of hope that one day one would come and make a difference, bring God's kingdom here on earth, there was hope and there was a thrill of hope. And that's what we're looking at this Christmas, the idea of an excitement, um, that thrill of the confident assurance of what God has promised us. For years, they waited and waited, and, and, and when God took a long time, 700 years, they became disappointed and discouraged. Then finally, when word had come that maybe the Messiah was born, they didn't like the backstory. He was born to a, a humble, poor couple in the backwater town of Bethlehem. And folks said it can't be. And others who wanted to hope in Jesus as Jesus grew up, he didn't do the things they wanted him to do. They wanted the Messiah to, to attack the, the Roman government and to overthrow the government and to establish the people of God as those who were in charge, and they were disappointed. You see, they had great expectations, and they believed in the hope, but when their expectations didn't happen, their hope began to wane. I wonder about me. I wonder about you. In the midst of difficulties and brokenness, in the midst of the uncertainties of our world, have we become, as a people of God, disillusioned, disappointed? Are we leaning toward what others are doing, kind of putting Jesus aside? It's why I love this series that we're looking at, The Thrill of Hope. We're, gonna, we're going back to the original baby reveal, and we're asking the question, what child is this? Like we sang in the song, what child is this? And are the promises that were promised 700 years before his birth, 2,700 years ago for us, can we count on them? Or is Jesus, for us, a disappointment? Let's look at the text. Isaiah 9, verses 2 to 6. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness. And, and I, I love the fact that, 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 that it's described as deep darkness. It's beyond what they could even ever comprehend happening like so many today. On them a light has shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now last week we looked at this idea of of uh, this wonderful counselor. And wonderful means miraculous. And counselor is, is a kind of, back then, a royalty that had wisdom to know the direction, that experiences what you experience. I don't know if you know that this, but there is a huge advertising campaign coming our way. Columbus is one of the target markets. And I only found out about this when I saw the billboard above Straders on Friday as I was driving by. The billboard just says something like, Jesus was unfriended too. And I'm thinking, what, what does that mean? Jesus was unfriended too. That, that's all the billboard said except at the bottom of the billboard, it says, hashtag, he gets us. Now, I, so I went to the computer, I looked up, 
hashtag he gets us. And there are several very wealthy Christians that have put together this multi-million, billion dollar campaign across the United States by Columbus, one of the test markets. And it's helping people who have never known about Jesus or walked away from Jesus to understand that he gets us. It, it's basically saying he is a wonderful counselor. That's what he's, you can get him because he gets you dash all of us. He gets us. And I hope that this campaign will click with the next generation that God, Jesus, born 2,000 years ago, is a wonderful counselor because he gets us, all of us. But this week, we're looking at the second term, which is mighty God. Now, in the Hebrew, mighty God is El Gabor. El means God. Whenever you see that in the Hebrew, El means God. Just to give you a hint, Beth means house. So this church is not named because of Bethel Road. We are not Bethel Presbyterian Church because we sit on Bethel Road. We are Bethel Presbyterian Church because we are the house of God. We just happen to be on Bethel Road. But whenever you see L, that stands for God. And so God Gabor, Gabor is Hebrew meaning powerful, strong one, warrior, valiant. Now, you could translate it instead of mighty God or God is called um, mighty, the God, the mighty one. And uh, throughout the Old Testament, God is called El Gabor, El Gabor. Now, Isaiah, here's what's crazy. Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ, 2,700 years ago, says that one is going to be born in the future and his name will be El Gabor. Now, he is saying the one born 700 years from now is the same as the El Gabor you are praying to and following in Isaiah. And, and, and Isaiah would refer to God as El Gabor. But now this strange text, do you see how people would say, well, wait a minute. You're talking about El Gabor through your whole writing, but now you're telling us 700 years from now, El Gabor is going to be born in our world? For the Jewish folks, that threw them because they're monotheistic. They didn't have the understanding of a trinity, which a lot of us are still trying to piece that together. So how does God become human? It was troubling. This child is going to be the who God is. And so we have 700 years ago, Jesus is born. This one that was prophesied. Now, if, if you were going to come from heaven to earth, wouldn't you think floating on a cloud would be a nice, appropriate way to enter Bethlehem? Or, or perhaps a giant escalator, you know, coming down from heaven. So people would have an idea that you were El Gabor. But to be born in a feeding trough as a human being could be disappointing. It would be troubling. This one who is the son of God, who is also God the son. God left heaven and became like 
us, but was different than El Gabor, but El Gabor, you see how troubling this birth is. And the Bible would tell us all the fullness of who God is dwells in this babe of Bethlehem. And, and in fact, we said it in the Nicene Creed. The, the Nicene Creed was put together in 325 because they couldn't put their mind around how the Father and the Son worked together. And so they came up with this, this phrase, homo usius, which means homo same, usius, ooh, stuff. Homo usius, that God and Jesus are the same stuff. That Jesus is very God of very God. That's what you proclaimed when you said the Nicene Creed. That was the crux of why the creed came together to identify that Jesus was not junior, was not a wannabe, but was also was God the Son. So we sang the song. Who is this child? What child is this? And so we go to the, the Gospel of John that maybe gives us the, the big picture of who Jesus is. In John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, in the beginning was the Word. Now we're going to find out in verse 14 that the Word was God and dwelt among us in Jesus of Bethlehem. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, not anything was made that was made. So his fingerprints are on all of creation. He wasn't just new in Bethlehem. He put this thing Together in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness does not overcome or understand it. It's, it's so hard to believe that God would do this thing, would come become like us. And John goes on in verse 9, the true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the word was made through him, yet the world did not know him. And this word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. And then John in verse 18 tells us, no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known to us. And so this idea that this mind-boggling, that the El Gabor of the Old Testament that was leading the people of God, 700 years ago, one would come that would be called El Gabor, that would have this relationship and this identity and be of the same substance with the Father. That's El part of the Gabor. And the prophecy says that this El Gabor child who was born, upon his shoulders the government will rest so the wonderful counselor knows the way. The mighty God has come to provide the way, to make the way work. So let's look at what the, the Gabor means, the mighty God. It, it's actually used in the Bible to, to describe a hero, a, a, a man, a person of valor, a warrior. In fact, you could say, his name would be called Wonderful Counselor, Warrior God. God became human to fight for us. God became human to be a warrior God to fight for us. Now you might say, why do we need someone to fight for us? Well, if you go back to Genesis, to creation, and if you remember that God said, uh, with, with Adam and Eve had this great relationship and the, Satan, the evil one, came and deceived them 
and they disobeyed God. And because of that, they walked away from God, and God had to turn his back on them. And then God hatched a plan. Now, actually, it was hatched before creation began because he knew of what stuff we were made of. And I, I love what the message says about this, um, the penalty for what has happened in the garden. The, the God told the servant, and this is out of the message, and I use this term, this language, so that you would know. The original language, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. But a little clarification, because you have done this, as he speaks to the servant, you are cursed, cursed beyond all cattle and beyond wild animals, cursed to slink on your belly and eat dirt all of your life. I am declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. Now, what you need to see here is that he, in the Hebrew understanding, women did not have offspring. Men had offspring. So is this a typo? No. This would be a very clear indication of a virgin birth birth of a child that has come through a woman and not the seed of a man. So I am declaring war between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers. He will wound your head, which is a fatal wound. You will wound his heel, which is not a fatal wound. So very much in the beginning, this broken relationship between humankind and God. God says, one day, I'm at war with you. And one day, a warrior king will come and do battle with you. The mighty God who's born in the crib in Bethlehem. So at the dawn of history, sin enters the world. And it destroys everything it touches. And one day, a Savior would be born because we need saving from our situation. We want one who will do battle, who will be a warrior God against sin, against evil. And the book of Hebrews tells us this. Since the children have flesh and blood, he, meaning Jesus too, shared in their humanity so that by his death, he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he had to be made like his brothers in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God and that he might make atonement for the sin of the people. On the cross, he took the sin of humankind. He paid the penalty. He was wounded. He died. He was buried. It was not eternally fatal, for he rose three days later, and he is the victorious God because he won the battle. This name, 2,700 years ago for us, 700 years ago before the birth of Christ, of mighty warrior God. And this name also means victorious God, that he is victorious. So why was Jesus born? So we'd have a nice tender story to sing on the 25th of, of uh, December. He was born for the cross. He was born to do a battle. He was born for victory to reestablish our relationship with our Heavenly Father. He is our warrior God who fought for us. He laid down his life for us. And because he is mighty, he is able to save. And that is the joy of Christmas. That is the joy of his birth. He is the warrior, victorious God who is mighty to save. Is 
Jesus mighty in your life? What happens when you and I are in a conversation with friends or people around us or we're in a situation and people start demeaning the name of Jesus or making fun of Christians or we're at a place where we could speak out for our mighty God and we are intimidated by the culture. We're intimidated by what people might think if we identify ourselves with the victor. You see, I, I don't think we live and the realization that he is the victor. The realization that he commanded the waves to be still. The realization that he, he commanded the winds to die down. That he healed the blind and the lame. That he called a dead body after three days out of a tomb. I think we understand the story like we understand the story of George Washington and we're touched by it, but I don't know that we're all in. I don't know that we believe it. And I have to say that about myself sometimes, and I actually heard the voice of God at the birth of my daughter when her heart stopped, and he said, she was mine before I ever gave her to you. You're going to have to trust me. And, and yet, how is it that we could become timid with our faith Timid with speaking out. We have a mighty victorious God and, and we live sometimes like we are embarrassed by him. We are ashamed. We are disappointed. And Isaiah would not want you to know this. Have you not known have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint, and to him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall fail and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait, who trust for the Lord, shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not grow faint. In Zephaniah 3.17, one of our favorite verses, because it talks about God singing over us. You, you heard that warms your heart, but don't miss the first part of it. The Lord your God is in your midst, is a mighty one, who will save, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exalt you with singing. Do you not know one day he will come with the armies of heaven and he will undo all that is done. He is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the mighty God. How, how crazy is it us, of us? that we would stay in the shadows, that we would hang our head, that we'd be nervous if somebody found out that we believed. Jude ends with this, and this was Jack's favorite blessing. Now to him, meaning Jesus, who is able to keep you from stumbling and is able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time, now and forever and ever and ever. Amen. You think about that. Pray with me. Oh, Lord, if uh, we could have a time of confession, again, we, I would confess. Sometimes if it's my faith, I live in the shadows. Sometimes intimidated by the culture around me instead of proud of the God who saved me, who is victorious, 
who sits on the throne, that when all the dust settles, is the only one left with any power at all. I pray for folks here who do not know you, that you would open their minds and their hearts to the power, to the might, to the victory of who you are. And for the rest of us, Lord, open our eyes that we may see, open our mouths that we might proclaim and set our feet in, feet in places where we could live out your power that we know to be true in spite of times that we might be disappointed. We pray these things in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. And may you leave with the uh, mighty, knowing the mighty nature of what, who Christ is and what he has done with the blessing from Jude. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and able to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. Go and...